according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. I invite you to um, a moment of silent prayer, especially to just kind of keep my uh, thoughts kind of straight so I kind of know where I'm going. Um, so because the, the pain is like doesn't go away and also just I'm a little bit fuzzy now that the meds have kicked in. So we'll see what happens with this. I want to preach on the gospel and uh, especially in light of the two funerals we just had, uh, Vaughn and Lori, to have some things to say about that some things to say about Charleston, of course, um, and then also um, uh, this idea that the, the one who is so exhausted that he falls asleep in the boat is also the one who speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. So that whole notion of the God come down, uh, that uh, Christ becomes as we are so that we might become as he is. Um, I want to play a little bit with that uh, incarnational kind of imagery. So that's the task. Anyway, we'll see what happens. So uh, let's open ourselves up to a moment of silent prayer that God might speak to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was told by the emergency room uh, doctors that even though they set the wrist well, that I probably was going to need surgery, and they gave me a number for someone I should call. I was having real difficulty getting into uh, hand surgery. Of course, it was the weekend, so I had to wait till Monday to call, um, and I just couldn't get any responses. So I called Dr. Bob, our own Dr. Bob here at Calvary, and I said, Bob, can you uh, call this uh, number and see if you can't get some response? I got a call from Dr. Roten within 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> So I got an appointment right away. I'm sitting in the examination room, and he walks in. He looks at me and says, you must have friends in really high places. <laughs> and I say to him, you have no idea. <laughs> but in this case, of course, it was Dr. Bob and not God that got me the appointment. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, this has uh, disrupted all my summer plans and not just having to deal with the reality of being restricted but also the reality of uh, tossing and turning at night and dealing with pain. I, I've come to appreciate so much more um, what you all go through when I come and visit you in hospitals, those of you who've had surgeries and uh, uh, just uh, a new understanding of what that's like to, to constantly deal with, in a sense, the storm of pain. Uh, that robs us of so many things, but especially of our kind of peace of mind, and we often wonder then uh, why these things happen. We had a prayer, I talked about this at uh, the, um, the funeral yesterday for Lori, that when, when it became clear that there was no more to be done, and that the time would come to just now move into that next phase where you get ready to go into the new reality that is the life that follows this one, we gathered in her room. Uh, she had fought that ovarian cancer for 10 years. Uh, we had been praying and hoping and had seen so many things that gave us uh, courage, but then it was clear that there was nothing left to be done. And so I began praying there in her room with the whole family gathered, and my prayer began like this. Lord, we are not very happy with you right now. This is not the outcome that we prayed for. We're having trouble believing right now that you are present in this place. And yet, those prayers that begin with fear and doubt and 
and struggle always seem to end in another place, just like the psalm does, where the psalm begins with lament and ends in praise. For we know that God is present in our difficulties, is present when we are afraid to be that calming presence. Calm me, Lord, as you calm the storm. Still me, Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me cease. Enfold me, Lord, in your peace. God enters into the reality of our human flesh in such a way that he does not just wear it as a garment, but he inhabits it so fully that he becomes exhausted by crowds pressing in on him just to touch the hem of his garment. He becomes exhausted by disciples the time and again just don't get it. He becomes exhausted by the opposition he receives from the religious leaders of his day. And yes, even his own mother, in the scene that happens right before this, his own mother says to him, do you not know what they're saying about you? Just stop it, Jesus. They think you're a lunatic. And so he gets into the boat just as he was, a human being, worn down by all the pain and suffering and sorrow that surrounded him, worn down by the mission he was on, knowing full well that it would not end well, that Jesus Christ would die. He didn't die of cancer. He didn't die of a heart attack. He didn't die of old age. He was murdered. An innocent victim. So that he might identify with the martyrs in Charleston. Now let me hasten to add this, because this is distressing to me. In the conversations in the media and on social media, Facebook, it seems to me that this tragedy has been usurped by people on both sides of the spectrum for their own ends, whether they're talking about gun control or more guns, whether they're talking about liberal causes or conservative causes. The point is, these nine people were murdered, and that this young man had every opportunity during that hour of Bible study to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to hear the witness of these nine martyrs speaking about their life of faith, their hopes and their dreams for what God might be doing in this world. So what do we do with these senseless deaths? I think you look into your own heart, dear people, even as I look into my own heart to identify any thoughts and desires within me that are not of God, but that harbor resentment and prejudice, that harbor ill will towards others. This young man will not escape the day of judgment. That day will surely come when all people will be gathered before the judgment throne of Christ. Before I make any suggestion of what might happen to him, let me say this, is when I stand before the throne of Christ in that final moment, I will be judged guilty because I am. And I hate to tell you this, but you will be judged guilty as well, because you are. 
And that's why it's important that it is Christ who sits on the judgment throne. The one who entered into the reality of this human flesh, weakened and wearied, worn down by grief. Weakened and wearied, worn down by trouble, weakened and wearied, so that even Christ had to call out to the one that he knew as Abba in those moments when he was troubled. Calm me, Lord, as you calm the storm. Still me, Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me cease. Enfold me, Lord, in your peace. When the calming presence of Christ enters into each heart and mind, then this troubled world, filled with violence and hatred, prejudice, and all manner of evil will be transformed into that place of perfection that Yvonne and Lori and many of your loved ones now inhabit. And the task for those of us who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked by the cross of Christ forever, our task is to usher in that future day of peace in whatever little way we are able. As we transform the part of the planet we inhabit, reform always begins in one's own heart so that we decide finally to make a difference in this world by being people of peace, by feeding the hungry, by visiting the prisoners, by praying for the sick, by holding on to a hope that one day all things will be made new. And what is our response then to the evil perpetrated by this young man? It's the response of some of the family members of the martyrs of Charleston. To forgive, as difficult as that is. And I would be lying to you if I said that my heart didn't cry out for some sort of vengeance. But that's what I need to confess so that desire for retribution might be replaced with a heartfelt desire for reconciliation. Let us this day commit ourselves to being people of peace, justice, and mercy, and kindness. And we can, and we will, change this world by that witness. To the God of love, who didn't just wear our flesh, but was worn down by it, dying our death so that we might live his life. Be our glory, honor, and praise now and always. Amen.